basically what we're going to be teaching today is one of the keys to living a successful life. Empower Squared is a group of professional speakers committed to helping our community learn and live the key principles of living in your greatness. Let's give a big welcome to the Empowered Square team who will bring the lessons of the gut check moment to life. Coleman Stokes, myself, George Casey, Arthur Wilson, and later on you, you will hear from Coach Earl Kitchens. Please let us welcome. Our first speaker today is going to be George Casey. And George is going to be teaching about the first key to success is desire. You must seek something that is bigger than you. And George Casey is a hope like figure, as you can see. And believe me, he has a voice to match. He is also a master of living and teaching about desire and purpose. Let's all give it up for George Casey. Good afternoon. Glad you all could make it out today. I was sitting over there debating whether I should use this microphone or not. I'm such a big voice. But I quieted down for you guys just a little bit today as I want to talk about desire. And in talking about desire, I want to paint a picture for you. And this picture is of me and a young man. There I was. Not much focus in life. No ambition to be anything bigger than I was, which was someone who partied on a constant basis. That's what I used to do. I used to live the party. Every single day was like a party to me. From school, and that carried on to afterwards. But there I was. Again, no, no hopes and no dreams, no aspirations of being anything better than I was. And at the time, what I was was a robber. I used to go out and rob people. I used to go out and rob people because I didn't have anything better to do. And I was a follower. I followed my friends as they robbed people. I followed my friends as they partied. I followed my friends as they did the things that they did, and I was right there with them. And the consequences that I, that I came with because of that lifestyle, because of partying, because of being extracurricular in my activities, I found myself, found myself homeless. I was living in the back seat of a car, in the back seat of a car. But I didn't have a car all to myself. I shared the car with two other people. And we had to fight sometimes who would get the back seat. That was the lifestyle that I lived. Homeless, as a homeless man at 21, and let me tell you a specific thing about when I turned 21. When I turned 21, I couldn't believe it. Not because it was a big, spectacular thing that I, I reached the age of 21, because I never saw it. And I never saw myself past 21. In fact, leading up to my 21st birthday, I, didn't, I wasn't sure I was going to make it. Because the lifestyle that I was living was the lifestyle that only promised one or two things, either going to jail or death. Those two things was the lifestyle that I was promised, going to jail or death. And I saw myself not getting to the 21st birthday. I found my, I, I, I visioned myself receiving the second, death. I figured that was the sentence I was gonna receive because of the lifestyle that I was living. During the homeless days, I found myself in Hinesville, Georgia where I was still homeless, but shuffling from place to place. I had a cousin that stayed in Hinesville at the time. And my cousin sat me down. She pulled a chair up and she sat me down. And she looked at me eye to eye. And until that moment, I don't think I've ever felt anybody look at me the way my cousin looked at me. And she asked me a question that made me think and it made a difference in the rest of my life. She sat me down and she said, George, what are you gonna do with your life? Very simple question to most people. What are you gonna do with your life? But to a person like me, I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a purpose. I didn't have a passion. I didn't have a desire to be anything more than what I was at the time. 
trying to console my cousin, I, I told her I had thought about joining the United States Marines. I, I said, you know, maybe that's what I might do. And again, my cousin looked at me. She looked at me. And she said, no. Don't make it maybe. You need to do that. You need to do that so you can have some kind of direction in your life, some kind of foundation in your life. And the funny thing about that is, at the time, I had a warrant out for my arrest. I had to pay a, a, it was a $350 fine. I didn't have that kind of money. So it stalled me out in life. But because of the love of my cousin, she wrote out a check for $350. Without even question, no question to it, she wrote out a check for $350. And she said, here, I want you to take this down, and I want you to go pay them people. And then once you pay them, I want you to go into the Marine Corps. And so that's what I did. I saw that she loved me that much, that she would write out a check for me with no questions asked. And that started me on my journey. And I ended up at Paris Island, South Carolina. 1995, November 26th. I'll never forget that day, November 26th, 1995. I'll never forget that, that day, that night, rather. It was pitch black. It, it, it looked almost like we were doing some kind of covert operation when we pulled in. Pitch black, and then once you get onto Paris Island, everything kind of lit up. And when we pulled in, there was a short drill instructor, probably about this big that made everybody get off what he called his bus and made everybody stand on what he called his footprints. And when I stand, stood on them footprints in South Carolina, Paris Island, where they make Marines, my life was transformed. My life began to change. My life began to change. But I wasn't altogether a new person. You see, so many times in life nowadays, we want everything to be instant. We want everything to be instant. We don't want to take the time to pursue what we really want to do, to form the greatness that's inside of us, that God already put inside of us. The greatness that's in everyone. It's not just in some of us. God put greatness in all of us. And we only have to recognize that greatness. And the Marine Corps was just a test that would help me to recognize that greatness. You see, when I got to Paris Island, they give you what's called an initial strength test. And you have to do a series of pull-ups and sit-ups and do a mile and a half run in under 12 minutes and 30 seconds. Well, see, I didn't have a problem with the pull-ups. I really didn't have a problem with the sit-ups. But I couldn't run. I couldn't run at all. In fact, during that mile and a half run, I only made it through about half of the mile before I completely gave up. And it wasn't like it wasn't, it wasn't a drill instructor behind me trying to push me, trying to motivate me. But at this point, I had quit so many times in life that it was easy for me to quit again. You know, see, they say, as a man thinketh, so shall he be. And so, for all my life, as I look back, so I love that Socrates said, he said, the unexamined life is not worth living. The unexamined life is not worth living. You see, you got to examine your life. You got to go back and find out why you failed. When you fail, you got to find out why you failed. And could you have made a difference? Could you have changed the way you thought about things and made a difference? And see, as I examined my life, I realized that every time I quit, it all started here. Every time I quit, it all started here. So I knew for me to change, it had to start in the same place. It had to start here. So I went out and I tried to run that mile and a half and, and I couldn't make it. So they're going to help me out a little bit on my journey. They put me in a little place that's called, they call it physical conditioning platoon something to kind of help you along, kind of motivate you along. 
And see, you had to pass the one two consecutive times. And I did that. Not because I had to, because I wanted to. See, at this time, I knew what I wanted. My desire started to grow. I thought about going back. But going back to what? Going back to what? See, there was nothing for me to go back home to. Homeless, friends that weren't doing much. There was nothing for me to go home to. So my desire kicked in. And I knew what I had to do. I knew what I wanted to do. My desire was to become a Marine. Even though I had quit time after time after time, I wanted to be a Marine. I wanted to be a United States Marine. So I fought through it. I fought through it. I fought through it. You know what, that was three of the toughest months of my life, but I fought through it. I wasn't looking for instant gratification. Why? Because I knew in my mind I wanted to be a Marine. You know, not only was it three tough months, but it was three of what I call the toughest months. Christmas, New Year's, Valentine's Day. I was in Paris Island from November to February. And see, on the block, what we call it, back home on the block, we had a little uh, tradition every year that we would rent out some hotel room for New Year's and have a big party. But I was at Paris Island. I was at Paris Island where I knew on New Year's Eve, all the people, all my friends back on the block were getting ready for a party. But me, I wanted to be a Marine. I knew I had to, I wanted to be a Marine. And the drill instructor helped me along and said, Casey, through all the pain I endured, he said, Casey, let me tell you something. He said, pain is only weakness leaving the body. He said, pain is only weakness leaving the body. And see, I had to set my mind state to believe that pain is only weakness leaving the body. Through all the sweat, through all the tears, through all the pain that I endured throughout boot camp, I knew that pain was only weakness leaving the body. You see, I, I came into Paris Island, like I said, I came in a homeless man. I came in as someone who was a robber, someone who was a thief, someone who didn't have much passion, no desire, no, no uh, desire, no picture of how I wanted to look when the process was done until I went to the Marine Corps boot camp. That was the, the push I needed. Because like I said, my two options, prison or death. Prison or death. But my desire kicked in. I wanted to be a Marine. I wanted to be a United States Marine. And I know I, here lately, as I speak, I, I speak more and more about God. But that's because, again, I've, I've had the chance, as Socrates says, to look back and examine my life. And I knew every time, as I look back on my life, every time that I thought I was alone, every time I thought I was by myself, I wasn't. I believe that God put my cousin in my life to be where she was just when I needed her, to ask me the burning question, of what are you going to do with your life? I believe that God was with me when I was homeless and sleeping in the back seat of the car because it could have been so much worse. And years later, I saw as one of, the, one of my friends that was homeless and sleeping in that car later with me. He ended up sticking around. And I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but he ended up sticking around. And I remember calling him after I graduated from boot camp. I remember I called him probably about a week before I was about to come visit. And I, you know, we, we was catching up on time, old time. And I said, man, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see you. It'll be about another week. Within seven days of me speaking to one of my great friends, someone that has been in the trenches with me, I got a phone call that says he was shot. He was shot in the head. And it wasn't by a stranger. 
It wasn't by a stranger. It was by someone that he knew, someone that we all knew. But somewhere in the trenches, everything went wrong. And my cousin, my good friend, was shot and killed. And to this day, I, I, I'll never forget what it says last words were. And it was, it was a, a popular masterpiece song at, at the time. When he got shot, his last words were, that's OK. As he looked at the guy, he said, that's OK. I'm still about I'm still about That was his last words. That's OK. I'm still about But he's no longer living. So my desire now, after joining the Marine Corps, after transforming my life, after adopting one of my favorite passages from the Bible, Romans 12, 2, that says, Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And see, that's where I was. I was in the same raggedy body, same raggedy body, but my mind had changed. My mind changed. I started reading books. I started being around positive people. And now my passion, my desire, is to be a motivational speaker, to speak to young people who were in the same boat that I was in. That's my passion. That's my desire. I don't want to see anybody else die a reckless death, a senseless, reckless death. So if I can touch one, just one, my job is done. My job is done. You gotta have desire. Now I'm gonna bring up my next, okay, I'm gonna bring up uh, another speaker is going to introduce our next speaker, but just I just want you to think about that. Think about Romans 12 too. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. Think about desire. What do you want to do out of life? What do you want to be out of life? And as long as you believe it, truly believe it, remember, you have a great decision. George, before you sit down, they tell me that there is no such thing as a used to be Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. So George, before I let you sit down, tell me one of those cadence when you were running that mile and a half, one of those cadence that got you through. What did it sound like, George? Hard uh, work, work. Hard uh, work, work. Hard uh, work, work.
please help me welcome Arthur Wilson as he talks about focus that desire. Everybody doing all right this evening? Is this is evening, this afternoon. George Casey talked about having desire. And I want to tell you, everybody in this room, everybody born has a desire. It's something that God gives us. It's inside each and every last one of us. The challenge is to identify it. This is where we get messed up at. Desires change, passions change as we go through life. As we age, as we grow through life, different things change. Our desires change. But whatever desire that we're facing at the time, where we are at this point in our lives, in order to make that desire manifest or come true, you have to focus. You have to, you have to focus in on it. Desire without focus equals failure. Desire without focus equals failure. I'm gonna give you an example of one time early in my life when I saw focus. I have two sons, older son Cody, younger son Kelby. Kelby is full of desire, all kinds of desires. He's been like that since he's been born. Before he could talk, he was trying to walk. Just, just desire, just want to do stuff. No focus, just desire. Well, Kelby wanted to play football. He's about nine years old. Took him down to the west side, signed him up to play football. Skinny little kid, not, not. No meat on his body at all. And the coach wants him to run the ball. I don't understand this at all. Why? He's going to get crushed. Something's going to happen. My son's going to get broken up. But Kelby has desire. Anything that he wants, he has a desire to go for. He goes at it hard. He just doesn't know how to focus. Or at that time, he didn't know how to focus. So about a week before their first game, Kelby is learning the plays. He's learning how how to get where he wants to go, which is to score a touchdown. That's all he wants to do, score touchdowns. No patience, no focus, no nothing. He just, wants to, he just wants to grab the ball and run. So they had a play designed exactly for him. And because I guess they considered he, he was kind of fast or whatever. So what he was supposed to do was swing around behind the quarterback. The quarterback hand him the ball, he'd take off running. But what Kelby kept doing was running to the quarterback Snatching the ball, taking off. In turn, he kept getting cracked, crushed, just beat. And no matter how much you try to tell him, Kelby, you have to do it the right way, he kept falling short. So Kelby's on the sideline, he's crying, he's mad, he doesn't understand. He wants the ball, the quarterback's not moving fast enough, not handling the ball fast enough. It all works if you work it, Kelby. Okay, so the next day, Saturday morning, it's time for this game, it's game day. I'm in the bed sleep. It's about 4.30 in the morning. Desire. I roll over in my bed and Kelby standing there. 4.30 in the morning. Fully dressed. Helmet. Shoulder pads. Pants. Them blue west side socks. Cleats. Mouthpiece. And he's looking at me. 4.30 in the morning. Dad, I'm ready to go to the game. <laughs> Are you serious? Now that's desire. That's desire. But Kelby lacked focus at that time in his life. So I told him, I said, I said, Kelby, the game, we don't have to be there until 8 o'clock, so you got like three and a half, four hours. Go downstairs, sit on the bed, and begin to see yourself running the plays, doing what you're supposed to do. Running them the way you're supposed to execute, the way you're supposed to see yourself scoring as many touchdowns as you want to. He had to have some kind of focus. In Kelby's mind, give me the ball, get out the way. I got it. But it wasn't working. It hadn't worked all in practice. For whatever reason, the coach felt like he could do it, we let him go for it. So finally, we get to, to the football field. We get to the football field. I pull him to the side like a father would do. And I said, listen, just have fun. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. Don't worry about it. My concern was, he wasn't, he wasn't going to do right because I hadn't seen him do right yet. He has his desire. He, he wanted, I'm telling you, he wants to do, if y'all know him, y'all know he wants to do big things, but he hadn't learned how to focus. He hadn't. 
first play of the game, Coach Lee calls his play, 17 in and around. Oh my goodness, I'm on side. I'm like, okay, all right, Kevin, here we go. He's back here. He's, he's doing a thing. He's positioned. Everything looks good. Center snaps the ball, and here he goes. He didn't go to the quarterback and snatch the ball, which surprised me. Perfect, I mean perfect. Then he's running this direction. The goal line is right here. I'm standing right there. I look in Kelly's eyes, and I see his desire. I see his desire. And he turned his head upfield, and he focused on that goal line. I saw his focus. He took off right down the sideline. Now, here I go. <laughs> I'm running beside him, right? <laughs> go, 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 go. Here come the linebackers. Here come the safeties. He didn't see any of that. He was focused. He was focused. He was driven. He was driven on where he was supposed to go. Straight through the end zone. It was about a 60-yard run. He was excited. I was ecstatic. Everybody, nobody believed he got it, but he did. And that was the first time that I seen Kelby reach a milestone in his life on focus. And it taught him a life lesson. It taught me a life lesson as well. That if you put your focus on any destination, any goal, with a desire, you can make it. You can make it. Nothing can stop you. You have to have the mentality that I'm going to make it. I will not stop, no matter what comes, because there are going to be hindrances. There are going to be linebackers. And there are going to be safeties. There are going to be fouls. There are going to be things that get in your way. It's called defense for the sports player. It's called defense. And if you take a hard hit and lay down and give up, you fail. Failure is only failure when you give up. But if you get up, you shake it off, you say, okay, go back to the huddle. I want the ball again. Give it to me again. That's desire. See, just because you get hit, you might lose your vision, but you don't lose your focus. I'm here to tell you right now, Kelby scored four, five touchdowns that game. Every time, not every time, because a couple of times he got lit up. But I knew after the first time when Kelby ran that touchdown, he understood that things had to be done right, and he also understood that he couldn't focus on the, on the defense. He couldn't be distracted. He had to stay focused on what he was trying to do. So he scored four touchdowns. I want to say four touchdowns. And I was excited for him, and I'm glad for him. Life lessons. In life, in life, we all have a desire. I said it earlier. But we have to learn how to focus. We have to learn how to make our desires, our goals, the centerpiece of our vision. We have to move everything about to put blinders on and move everything out of the way and focus on it. In our minds, we know that there's defense. We know that there's going to be things in the way. We know this. It's life. Life is not a cakewalk. We know this. But if other people can succeed at whatever, you can too. I can too. If you're here, you have a desire. God put it in you. It's up to you. It's up to us as individuals to focus in on the desire, to make it manifest, or to go get it. And once we get it, and we understand that it's ours, we can claim it, we don't stop there. What is the next desire? What is the next thing? Because we understand now, we understand now how to make it, how to make it come to pass. Success, like uh, Mr. Casey said, it's not easy, but it is simple. It's like everything else, it's a principle. And once you learn how to be successful, it's a rotating wheel. It's a rotating wheel, just like failure. I'm going to go back to Mr. Casey said, he was so used to giving up. He was so used to giving up. So he gave up in his run. But when you're used to winning, when you're used to winning, and winning doesn't necessarily mean coming in first place. Understand that. Winning means completing. Not coming in necessarily first place. It can only be one first place in every event. But you came, you, you, you came through whatever you had to get through to get to the place of competing, and you competed. You gave your best. You did your all. You left it all on the field. You are a winner. Every last person in here is a winner. Every last person. Before you were manifest in the world, you beat out 100 billion sperm cells. You are a winner. You know how to win. That's why you're here. 
that's why you're here. So you don't give up. You don't lay down. No matter what bumps, no matter what bruises, no matter what distractions, no matter else, no matter who else lays down, no matter who else stops, you don't lay down. You get up. Your focus has to be bigger than what anybody else can see. But you have to hone in on it. You have to make it the centerpiece of your vision. You have to lock in on it. When we were young, we used to take magnifying glasses. You know, the magnifying glasses, we used to burn ants or each other's neck. How about we used to do? As big as the sun is, you hold the magnifying wherever you want it to go, the magnifying glass, wherever you want it to go. And the rays would they, they, they would narrow down like a laser. And it will burn. You go outside and do it now, it will burn whatever. Just by holding it there. That's how you have to have vision. That's how, that's how you have to focus on whatever it is that you're after. You have to, you have to have laser-like vision on your goals, on your dreams, on your desires, and don't give up. When you see the distractions coming, and sometimes you do see them, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have the option to make a decision to be distracted. In other words, you have a choice. You have a choice to do this or not. And if this does not line up with your vision, what you're focusing on, you have to be big enough to say no. Not right now. It's not time for me. No. And let your partners do whatever it is that they're going to do. Will you always get it right? No, you won't. No, you won't. But you can't give up. You can't give up. You have to keep moving. You have to keep moving. You have to keep pressing. It's your life. It's your life. You made it here. You're a winner. You have a desire. Focus in on a desire. Put your goal in your vision. Don't stop till you get where you're going. Just want to say thank you to Mr. Casey and Mr. Wilson for their words of encouragement on desire and focus. Uh, they are major aspects.